The tables have turned. Rosie Gray interviews me in this episode of the podcast. She is the journalist who put together the most recent profile of Nassim Taleb that you might have seen feature in The Spectator. And while this might be old news to some of you, for those who don't know, it was actually via Nassim Taleb that I got into podcasting at all in the first place. Back in 2020, I created a little show called the Nassim Taleb and Inserto Podcast, which was my rambling attempt at surmising and discussing interesting themes and topics from Taleb's five book series, which include, in order, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, The Better Procrusty, Skin of the Game, and Andy Fragile. Actually, the last two are backwards. Andy Fragile and Skin of the Game. That little show, the Nassim Taleb and Inserto Podcast, experienced some organic growth over the years, despite very rarely having any episodes published there, but it created this beautiful little moment of serendipity for me as it was discovered by Rosie during her investigation of Taleb for her profile. I was shocked and overall quite nervous when she reached out to me, but the audio which follows is an edited recording of me being interviewed by Rosie for her wonderful spectator profile of Nassim Taleb, many quotes from which ended up appearing in the final article. Links to Rosie and the description, a link to the profile is in the description, and as well, guys, I'm trying to grow my socials, so I've started posting clips and content on Instagram, follow me there, a link to that, of course, is as well in the description. So, of course, it wouldn't be a podcast introduction without me reminding you to pump your juice, but with absolutely no further ado, here is me being interviewed by Rosie Gray. Why don't we start just like, just fill me in a little bit on your background a little bit. Where you from, and how did you kind of start getting into Talent's work? Okay, cool. Um, I mean, who I am and where I'm from is 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 not that interesting. I'm just a uh, uh, from Australia. I uh, live in Sweden. Um, who I am is a someone who's trying to become uh, a podcaster full time, um, but I am a an account executive for for a SaaS company. Um, how did I get into Taleb? This was in 2018 or 2019. I had, um, yeah, I was listening a lot to the great Naval Ravikant. And at the time, I would pretty much have listened to or read anything that Naval had suggested. And he had, uh, he did an interview uh, for some cryptocurrency event where he was interviewing this, uh, you know, interesting Lebanese fella, Nassim Taleb. And he said in the interview that Nassim Taleb's uh, work is the type of stuff that will still be read a thousand years from now, you know, which is extraordinarily high praise from um, someone who I, you know, have deep, deep admiration for, which is Naval Ravikant. And so, yeah, that was 2018, 2019, probably the trailing embers of 2018. And I, um, I picked up then Full by Randomness and I was just compelled you know i was completely sucked in um you know it turns out in hindsight i have since uh discovered that i've got quite a weak spot for anything that talks about randomness chance you know serendipity probability um in a fun sort of uh not mathematical way or scientific way but in a fun i don't know uh cultural way that's probably a terrible way to describe it but um yeah, after full by randomness. Like talking about how it's sort of not just in a sort of dry, like statistical sense, but how he talks about randomness and chance, like in people's daily lives. Yeah, exactly. Not not how probability is expressed, you know, statistically according to um, some academic setting, but how you can actually map those lessons onto your daily experience and start to see the world a little bit differently. Um, and I 100% had that experience with Taleb. So I went through full by randomness and then I chopped the rest of the inserto, um, you know, in order. So black swan, better procrastinate, and fragile skin of the game, um, within seriously, within like two or three weeks, it was all I was doing, you know, it was totally sucked in and I'd never read anything like it before. And, um, I've heard, uh, Sam Harris used this metaphor before that it was, you know, like a firmware upgrade for his brain. Now he definitely, Sam Harris did not say that about Taleb. They have their own feud. Uh, Sam Harris said that about, um, uh, a, a university course he took on this philosophical subject of lying. Um, but I thought it was just a perfect way to put it because I had, I had the same experience with Taleb's inserto. It was like a firmware upgrade to the brain. You know, I, I could not see the world the same way before and after. Uh, you know, I started to see just in group dynamics, um, in 
things happening totally outside of my control, the, 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 the themes of the inserto at play. So give me, give me sort of an example of like, um, you know, an area of, of your life where this like really resonated with you, these themes. Oh, that's a good question. Um, how does it affect me in my personal life? Rather, it is a it is opening up your eyes to the role that randomness plays, sort of in the universe, which is just to say in your day to day life. It is an acknowledgement of how rampant randomness is as an unknown variable in almost everything that you do, and it is a, it changes the way you look at winners. It changes the way you think about survivorship bias, noticing how rampant survivorship bias is in so many different things you do. Um, And he has this great blindfolded crossing the road metaphor, which is just to say, you know, you could cross the road blindfold and make it to the other side. And while in the meantime, someone else crosses the road blindfold off, they're dodging the traffic, but they still get taken out and they don't make it to the other side. The guy who crossed blindfolded, he just got lucky. Whereas the person who um, takes the blindfold off and at least tries to navigate the risk throughout their lives, um, that metaphor, I suppose, is some type of way of saying that. It's just, it makes me notice and think about the role that randomness plays in my life a lot more. Um, And I guess actually a better answer for you would be the way that I think about serendipity has completely, my my eyes have been completely open to the way I think about serendipity because of reading Nassim Taleb. So, um, you know, serendipity is just the random um, upside occurrence from a meeting, you know? So for example, you know, we get off the phone call, you get on the train, you're going home, and you happen to sit down next to somebody who you start talking to and it turns out that's the love of your life. You spend the rest of your lives together. You know, had our phone call gone on for an extra 30 seconds, you would not have been in a situation where you would have sat with that person. Total serendipity. Um, and the thing is, is just you can sort of force serendipity by putting more potential nodes out into the universe. So for example, we're having this conversation. It's a serendipitous outcome for me because I happened to produce a podcast that went up on the internet. When I had done that, I was not doing it because Rosie Gray would eventually reach out to me and potentially quote me in a spectator piece. It's that is like the chance upside occurrence that comes from it. So I think thinking about serendipity is 100% something that um, I would not think about the same way if it weren't for Nassim Taleb. What inspired you to start doing the podcast? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I, I was I was thinking about that in preparation for this, um, and I, I honestly don't know. It could have just been a sudden burst of creativity um, on a day where I wasn't doing much, um, and I think that actually might just be what it was. And if it is, it's quite funny because that is very Talebian in itself. Because his whole like shtick about being a flaneur is that he has uh, unscheduled time. You know, he takes a walk and sort of feeds into his instincts. If he feels like working, he works. If he doesn't feel like working, he doesn't. Um, and if that is actually the case of how the podcast started, and I'm not just, I'm not just, you know, my memory isn't just fooling me. Um, that's quite a you know neat little little anecdote but honestly it's just a case of i was reading the books i listen uh crazily to podcasts even more so back in 2018 19 um and it, yeah and as you know i've since created a few other podcasts so i was already predisposed to do podcasts but um uh specifically to create the nissin taleb one i think it was just after a long walk and a sudden burst of creativity and energy, I put it all together. And once it was put together, I mean, you may as well edit it. You may as well put it up there and just, you know, roll the dice, see how it goes. And how has it gone? Like, what kind of audience have um, have you been able to attract? Yeah, I, I don't engage with the audience there really at all. Um, I can tell you that it hasn't translated to a big Twitter following. It hasn't translated into um, any sort of monetary upside. I don't have any sponsors on the podcast. Uh, the downloads are quite good though. You know, it's over 150,000 download- lifetime downloads now, and that's over only like 30 episodes. So um, for a podcast that has never had any promotion done to it, um, 
you know, it does well. And I think that's just simply a case of it being the first organic search when someone puts in the sim to lab into a, a podcast algorithm. Um, but the audience, occasionally I'll get an email. Um, occasionally I'll get a photo from a guy in, you know, like France or New York. And he's always some sort of uh, fat Tony lookalike, um, which is quite funny. And so, uh, some nice upsiders come from it. I've, ha- I've had a couple people who, who roll through Stockholm, reach out and I end up getting some beers with them and talking and they become friends. Um, I got to do a presentation to a consultancy firm here in Stockholm last year because of it. Um, but Beyond that, I don't have actually any relationship at all with the audience, except for a couple of people that have reached out to me. How would you sort of like characterize the like Taleb fandom? You know, you described these kind of fat Tony types. Yeah. Like, who's what do you think is like kind of the typical? You know, because he does he does definitely have like fans basically that are really into what he does. Oh, hundred percent. Like, what's your take on like? sort of typical profile yeah that's a good question and it's one that i i'm i'm completely unqualified to answer because i i actually i don't i'm not really across taleb's public image you know i I follow him on twitter but i'm not a big twitter user myself so i don't really see much except for obviously all the drama that rises to the top because of the twitter algorithm all the conflict the abrasiveness you know like the 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 trolling of the crypto community and so forth Um, but it's really hard to say what the typical Taleb fan is. I think he's got a bit of a cult following in financial circles because of writing the black swan. But the hilarious thing there is that they pretty much all misinterpret the black swan as some sort of playbook for how you can predict the next one. And they just miss the core theme of the book, which is that the black swan is inherently unpredictable. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't offer anything uh, that insightful there. What the typical Taleb fan would be. What do you think of his Twitter presence, which is very, you know, as you said, there's a lot of drama. Yeah. On, and he's very like pugnacious. He gets in fights with people a lot. Definitely. Um, I think it's a combination of two things. The first being that. Um, it's the Twitter algorithm itself, right? So uh, the things that are that have conflict, the things that are about crypto um, and the things that are sort of negative, they get significantly more engagement than does, um, you know, Taleb's like nerdy posts about mathematics and stuff. And so you definitely get a survivorship bias from just ingesting Taleb via Twitter. If the only exposure you ever have to Taleb is via Twitter, then you're 100% gonna be left with the opinion that he's this big, rude, obnoxious guy. Um, So, but I think that's a combination of two things. It is the one, the Twitter algorithm that rewards engagement of conflict and abrasiveness and rudeness and crypto. Um, But the other side of it is as well, is that Taleb is, he is a character straight out of skin in the game, you know? And I think he really, really models himself on the idea of a sort of old Spartan or, you know, an old like New York mafia guy who has a a code of honor um, and is authentic and you can rely on him and he's consistent. I think Taleb, you know, really models himself in this type of persona. um, And which means that if he is attacked, he's not necessarily the type to just sort of, um, you know, turn the other cheek. I'm sure he'll occasionally turn the other cheek. In fact, certainly he occasionally turns the other cheek, but, uh, a combination of the Twitter algorithm rewarding all of the um, all of the all of the conflict, in addition to Taleb being this character straight out of skin of the game who would rather you know die on his shield than return home with it, he he ends up getting into a bunch of spats, um, and you know it's also like a the crypto community is also very weird online, um, you know it's full of mostly trolls right and shitloads of bots and stuff, so I think what we actually end up seeing. Um, Taleb's persona on Twitter is mostly formed by the survivorship bias of a, of a pretty, you know, woeful algorithm at the end of the day. I really think that's what it is. You're, you're, so that's Taleb on Twitter. Taleb as an actual person, what is his profile? I've never gotten the chance to meet him. You know, I think he would be 
just a terrific person to share a meal with, um, you know. So he'd be a terribly interesting person to sit down with. You know, he can talk about everything. Um, and I've actually met a couple of people who have either engaged with him personally or actually have a relationship with him. Um, and they all say the same thing, that he is just like a really nice, kind, respectful, normal guy. Um, and so that's why I think that he leans into his persona on Twitter 100% because he's a smart guy. He understands what it does for book sales and so forth. But I, want, I in fact, I don't even want to level that against him because even that is like a small slight against being an authentic person, which I think at the end of the day is to live sort of highest priority. So on the topic of um, crypto, um, I think you mentioned at the beginning of the call that when you first kind of heard of Taleb, it was at, it was in the context of watching um, this guy Naval Ravikant's interview at like a cryptocurrency conference. Like, were, were you, are you somebody who's interested in crypto and I'm wondering whether, like, the Taleb trajectory on crypto has, like, altered what you think of it. Um, no, I... Look, I've ridden the, the crypto waves, um, but I'm definitely not interested in crypto. I, uh, You know, if you asked me to explain the blockchain, I'd give you the most basic answer. Um, the reason I was watching that interview is because of Naval Ravikant. So... I was deeply, I still am, but, you know, deeply interested to see what Naval would say. Um, you know, this was, I think, just after he was on uh, the Knowledge Project and Joe Rogan, and he had a big, interesting, he had a lot of big, interesting things to say. And so the only reason I was watching that interview was because of Taleb. It had nothing to do with crypto. So, I, but I'm just curious, like, what do you think of, you know, because I know that Taleb got a lot of flack for sort of, like, reversing course on crypto. And, you know... I think a lot of people would argue that he turned out to be right in the end. I mean, like, given what we've seen over the past, like, year or so. Um, what's your take on that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, Taleb thinks that the true value of Bitcoin is zero. So, you know, he definitely knows how to, like... Uh, uh, deliver a nice pithy message that's going to annoy maximum people. But... Um, you know, I don't know what to think about it. I'm, I'm not that engaged with the community. I think Taleb changed his opinion and, um, you know, didn't really care that it was going to cause a big backlash in his audience or anything. Um, you know, I think he's happy to get rid of crypto Bitcoin ma maximalists from his uh, from his audience, to be frank. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah I, 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 do, I see what you mean. Um, I'm curious, like, are there positions that he's taken that you really disagree with um the thing is is i don't actually really know broadly positions he's taken um if you throw some at me i'll, I'll see if it rings a bell but really like uh rosie and this was what i was tr maybe uh trying to explain the other day like i'm just a guy who's really read his books i haven't engaged so much in his 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 public image as much um but give me some positions he's taken and and i'll see if i have an well, opinion for example, on like didn't you i feel like i listened to an episode of yours where you were sort of questioning his assertion that the pandemic was not a black swan yes i definitely did um but it was less of me like questioning him and me sort of just openly because he came out and said it wasn't a black swan for x and y reasons um and I sort of was like, okay, but by your definition, you know, uh, a black swan uh, has to meet three components, which is, you know, they have to have an extreme impact. Um, they have to be, you know, for like the GFC, the colonization of Latin America, they have to be an extreme event, 9-11, 2004 Indonesian tsunami, and they are only explicable after the fact. Um, and so I think for like, they're the qualifications for a black swan. And I think Taleb was saying that it does not meet number three of only being explicable after the fact. And so my podcast was just, um, sort of saying, oh, is it, was it actually only explicable after the fact or was it not? Um, you know, that, that it was kind of like an open question. I, I don't think I was necessarily i'm curious like in your uh sort of day-to-day -day life you know because one thing about Taleb's work is that it you know has a lot of like kind of macro level theorizing and takes and and prescriptions for how systems should work but it's also there's a lot of like stuff about literally like what people should eat like <laughs> what kind of exercise people should yeah do. right right you know like yeah. people think about not eating 
anything that like there wasn't a word for a thousand years ago, like or, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how much of that have you kind of taken on board? Yeah, I mean, none of it. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't <laughs> ascribe to that at all. I mean, but also anything nutrition and sort of weight related on um, on on the internet is just like a fucking bonfire. It's totally not worth engaging in. You know, I mean, Taleb's like. You know he's a he's a deadlift maximalist, right? It's the best bloody exercise you could possibly do. And then you go on another page and you realize, oh, maybe the deadlift is really bad for your spine and an unnatural move or, or whatever. And yeah, yeah, maybe it makes sense that we only eat things that had a name a thousand years ago, sure. Um, but like, I, I quite enjoy eating shit food occasionally, so I don't, I don't. Um, I, I think that those fun little like side bits that that form the personality that is Nassim Taleb I, I think they're kind of inconsequential you know who he is is the inserto it's those five books um that, that's his contribution to culture that's that's what he's going to be remembered for um and you know I, I just don't pay much attention to the other stuff um which is your favorite of the inserto that's a that's a nice question um it, it's hard to say I think if you'd ask me a year ago it would have been anti-fragile um but the longer i i sit with it i i think it's fooled by randomness um because that's the sort of like that's his introduction that's his great introduction to the world the great idea like how pervasive is the role of randomness on your life and how ignorant are you to its role here is a couple of hundred pages to try and explain that to you. So I think the one that, you know, if you ask me on my deathbed, it's, it's probably almost certainly going to be full by randomness. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, in his work, he, he definitely like makes a lot of references to, well, I mean, tons of stuff, but like, you know, classical authors, like the Stoics, um, various philosophers, I'm wondering, like, whether, did, like, did his work function at all for you as, like, a way to learn about, you know, other works? Like, did it sort of, like, introduce you to things that you might not have gotten into before? Um, I don't, I can't think, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I have also taken an interest in the Stoics, but I don't think that that came from Taleb. Um, but I, I think... Um, the great one of the great reasons for the inserter being so popular is actually because he makes so much reference to the ancients and to the classics. Uh, everything is explained through some sort of anecdotal metaphor that was almost BC, uh, and that feeds into his whole idea of the Lindy effect. Uh, but I think um, I, I can't think of of a specific example where I you know sort of took up an interest in some classical text because Taleb mentioned it in passing um if you were to quiz me on things I know about the ancients it probably all comes from the inserto to be honest so it's very sort of uh, uninformed largely mm. what's your sort of media diet like like how you mentioned Joe Rogan like what are sort of yeah podcasts and stuff that you're into? yeah um my favorite podcast is one called hello sport uh which is a sydney-based guys uh, quite similar to me um, but that's got absolutely nothing to do with Nassim Taleb. Um, I, you know, my main sort of podcast is this A Curious Worldview, which is um, which is good journalists, good authors, good business. So my media diet is people like uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, people like Jordan Harbinger. Um, I think Lex Friedman can do a really good job. Um, I... Um, I listen to, I list, I like all the Economist stuff. I love Project Brazen. If you know what Project Brazen is, that's Bradley Hope and Tom Wright. It's a bunch of investigative journalism stuff. Um, I'm just looking through I think my. I should give that a listen. Yeah, it's unbelievable, truly. Um, Econ Talk, Russ Roberts. That's a friend of Taleb's. I'm a big fan of that. Um, Equity Mates in Australian Macro Voices. Eric Townsend. I think he's very good. Um, Conversations with Tyler, Tyler Cohen. I think he's really good. 
Tim Ferriss, you know, he's probably my introduction to podcasting. I actually love him. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a fella called, uh, called Joe Walker who runs the Jolly Swagman podcast, which, um, I, I hold as like my North star. Like that's the podcast that I sort of compare myself the most with, which I want to, I can't, I'm constantly inferior of, but want to one day meet it. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty decent look at it. I, I list, I watch Swedish news, um, and I read the economist and I suffer clickbait for the Royals, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. Couple of years. Yeah. So absolutely. What are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> um. How's your Swedish, by the way? Oh, it's getting there. Yeah. Is it hard? Uh. Well, yeah. Any other learning any other language is hard, but it's definitely easier than Spanish or German or uh, French or something like that. That's interesting. Is it is that due to the structure or is it due to like the sounds? Uh, the structure. Yeah, no, I 100% will. Um, I, I, the only reason I haven't um, kept up to date with that one is just because, you know, I, 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 I must also make a living. So, you know, I'm, I'm working full time and, and I've got all these other side projects that I work on, you know, like we spoke about the other day. I'm definitely an, insp- an aspiring journalist. So, you know, I'm trying to also pitch stories, write stories. So there's just so much happening. And, and Taleb, you know, he, he was he was my, my number one intellectual influence for several years. And I guess I sort of just moved on. And so now it's... Um, it's other stuff, but you know, speaking with you and and uh, going over what I've written about him, it's definitely sort of re-inspired me a bit. And around the launch of this article, I'll definitely produce a podcast. Um, I've also had a draft for quite a while, which is just titled, you know, what I learned from Nassim Taleb, which is me trying to really break down what are the what are the what are the big ideas that he that he uh, you know that he wrote down, which left an impression on me. Yeah, I don't know much about him, but I saw that they kind of fell out. Um, can you explain what happened there? I, I really don't know. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I, but I, I, there's, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, like, I, I think regardless of whether they fell out or not, I mean, the Lindy Man was getting a lot of um, getting a lot of flack for like plagiarizing. <laughs> yeah, not a good no. look. Not a good look. Well, you know. No. By the by, the measure of Hammurabi's law, by the measure of skin in the game, and Taleb, you know, he is completely unforgiving when it comes to a show of inauthenticity like that. And so, um, maybe that is simply just one case of plagiarization is enough for Taleb to like, you know, leave you on the curb. I think because um, there's also another guy called Joe Norman, who was a who was a actually like wrote a wrote some sort of paper, academic paper with Taleb. And I also don't know the details here. It's very gossipy, but he, um, they've as well fallen out and I, I don't know what over, you know? Huh. Yeah. Actually, somebody else had mentioned that to me too. I wonder what happened. Yeah. I'll try to figure that out if it's important. Unless it's just like, as you said, gossipy. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, look, I'll let you go. I really appreciate you taking the time. Before we get off the phone, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, for the interview, I, I, I can't think of it. I mean, you know, I think that any, I think just to add on, I, the, the big way, like the big ideas that really influenced me the most from him is the relationship between group size and complexity, uh, the, the anti-fragile threshold to disorder, um, you know, everyone talks about anti-fragile in very simplistic terms, but they all forget the most important part, which is Taleb's, um, threshold to disorder you know it is not simply the case that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger no there is a big threshold between actually what yeah and then uh, the minority rule is a really really interesting one i can give you an example of you know a former australian prime minister like how the minority rule is actually there that's a real life example from taleb v negativa huge fan of that addition via subtraction and then as well um extremist stand versus mediocre stand you know like really uh, communicating so crisply and so pithily the how different domains are distributed and um, 
how that's an explanation again for why things might be the way they are and it's not to do with like some big you know corrupt uh conspiratorial interests no it's simply just a case of the way the domains are set up and how they work and um so uh yeah though i I guess i'll end on those those are big big ways that taleb made me uh, change the way that i sort of see the world Cool. Well, yeah, I appreciate it, Rosie. Thanks for thinking of me. And, and uh, yeah, I'll be in touch about uh, asking your help to get me uh, somehow on the right track to publish one of these profiles that I've got brewed.